Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with two very special nonprofits that I think you need to know about. Our first guest today is Mark and Kirsten Palm. They're here today to share with us their nonprofit, Samaritan Aviation. Mark is the president and co-founder of Samaritan Aviation. He visited Papua New Guinea in 1994. While trekking through the jungles and seeing the desperate need of the people, he felt that God was calling him to this country and to devote his services to the people of Papua New Guinea. Kirsten Palm has earned a bachelor's degree of arts and a master's in cross-cultural education from Point Loma Nazarene University. She has her second teaching degree in health sciences. She's been a part of short-term mission trips to Mexico, Portugal, Chile, and Papua New Guinea. She's been a part of Samaritan Aviation since 1998, and their children, Sierra, Drake, and Nolan, love helping out and being part of this ministry. So let's welcome to the show, Mark and Kirsten Palm. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. It's great to be here. Oh, what a joy it is to have the both of you here and to talk about the work that you're doing. Okay, so how did this all start? Well, it's quite a long story. Uh, I'll give you a little background on my, myself, um, uh, being a third uh, generation aviator. And uh, to give you some, yeah, just some brief of what we're doing, we're, we're working in Papua New Guinea, providing uh, services, medical services to remote communities using seaplanes. Uh, but growing up for me, I was a third generation aviator. My grandpa flew in World War II and uncles flew airplanes, cousin of uh, Delta pilot now. And uh, that was kind of my background. My father was a minister. And so I had this uh, upbringing where aviation was a big thing. And, and uh, my father ran a homeless mission as uh, when I was in high school out in California. And so service was a big thing in our family. So uh, th- kind of those two things. I had a moment in uh, I know this is called Moments, uh, your show, but I had a moment in, in Mexico as a high schooler when I was down building houses for uh, people uh, un- people that needed help down there. And I just had a moment where I, I just felt like uh, God spoke to me. And, and he. Uh, what I heard was, Mark, I want you to use your passion for people in aviation to share my love in a remote part of the world. And that one moment uh, completely changed my life and uh, came back to, to uh, California. I finished school, what started all the, the, the flight training and, and the aircraft engineer training, met my wife, Kirsten, who's here with me today. And uh, we started this this journey, went over to uh, Papua New Guinea as a 19-year-old with a friend. And uh, really, that's where we saw the need, you know, living on the islands with the people and um, <clears throat> seeing the need for medical service. There was just no access, no hope to these remote communities when, when sicknesses came up, when uh, breach births. Uh, any type of medical emergency, snake bites, those things. Uh, these people did not have uh, access or hope in those situations. And water, there's water everywhere over there. And uh, so that's really where the, the background of, of, of uh, where Samaritan Aviation came from. That was kind of the vision from that trip. Uh, we came back and literally spent 10 years going around America telling the story of the need, trying to raise money for a seaplane, trying to get our organization off off the ground. And, um, yeah, finally in 2010, uh, my wife and I and, uh, our three kids arrived in, in Weewak, Papua New Guinea. And, uh, I put a, put the plane back together with a bag of tools in the capital and, uh, it flew it in, uh, to the North coast there. And, uh, we started these life saving operations, uh, almost 10 years ago now. My goodness. Kirsten, when Mark first came to you and was telling you about this idea, what did you think? Well, it started out pretty early on in our relationship. Um, On our very first date, he gave me the warning and he said, um, you know, I want to be a bush pilot in Papua New Guinea. Um, Had, you know, if, if that is okay with you to um, have that kind of a life, then, you know, we can continue and see if this works out. But if not, then we could just be friends. So I had the, in the very first date, knowing exactly what his passion and plan was. And, and, you know, he was basically asking me if I was on board with that idea or not. (laughs) That's, you know, and I, I really applaud the both of you. I mean, how courageous you are to 
do what you do. You're helping so many people. And it really, I mean, it's, it's taking you a while to get to the place where you even got your first plane going. Yeah. I think, you know, that's the part that, um, it, it was hard, you know, every year after year, people were asking us, when are you going to be over there? You know, we had a five-year plan initially that took a little over 10 years, but, um, you know, we just kept seeing progress every year. And uh, I think partly too, we were growing the different jobs that we had during that time, uh, growing as people, and it all prepared us uh, to be successful once we arrived. And um, yeah, so the journey, I believe the journey is half of it, right? When we look at life and, and the goals that we're all uh, striving for, the journey is is the important part, you know, how you deal with fighting through adversity and all of those things grow you as people. And um, and so when it gets hard and when it got hard and over, you know, 10,000 miles away, um, we were we had we had some re, some experiences to lean on uh, to help get us through the hard times. So I think that yeah, it was it was quite the uh, quite the journey. Uh, I don't recommend you know starting aviation organizations. I think for us, uh, you know, there was nothing else like this. You know, you know, we're working. You know, people don't realize uh, Papua New Guinea. It's the second largest island in the world, and uh, you know, eight million people live on the half that we work on. Uh, and and uh, these people, they call it the last frontier. And um, and in the areas that we work, we're working on a 700 mile river. Um, these people, literally, there's there's one hospital, you know, for 500,000 people, and that one hospital is on the coast, on the north coast. And uh, 220,000 people live on a 700 mile river. And there's no access for those people. It takes days to get to that one hospital. And, um, and so when, when we first went and heard story after story of people dying, trying to get to that one hospital, you know, having this ability to really revolutionize this idea of service delivery, to have a, an airplane that can land anywhere on the 700 mile river and save a life, you know, when, when they have a breach birth and when there's a snake bite and tribal wars and all the things that we deal with over there, malaria is a huge issue, tuberculosis, sickness, outbreaks, um, try to get people immunized. Uh, uh, polio came back this year, for example. But then you have these, uh, this, this idea of, of hope and no hope. You know, without Samaritan Aviation being there, for most of these people, there's no hope. And so that's really what we're offering, um, access and hope to these people uh, when they desperately need it. And it's, it's been an amazing, amazing journey, and we feel blessed to be part of it. Oh my goodness. You know, I was just floored to see some of the statistics in regards to, you know, like infant, infant mentality rates. You, you look at these things, you're like, my goodness, you know, they, there needs to be more people like you helping people that are in Papua New Guinea. Yeah, I think in this area, uh, for sure, the needs are great. You know, uh, in some of these communities, they don't name their children until they're two years old. Other babies because the infant mortality rate is so high, and so I think um, you know those those are those are real things that we don't face here in the states. You know, um, and even the hospital that we bring people into is is not something that you and I are used to going to here in the states. The just the abilities that the doctors have, the machinery or the you know the the technology is just not not there either. So they're they're years and years behind where we're at, uh, but it's their only their only hope, you know, and, um, uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one story of bringing in a, I landed on the, the side of the river one day and I was picking up a pregnant lady and preach birth and they loaded her in. And as I'm loading her in the plane, another boat ride drives up in uh, another canoe. And there's another lady with, with, uh, you know, a preach birth as well. Uh, we were like, okay, let's go. We load her in and, Fly back is about a forty-five minute flight back to the hospital, and uh, you know, being able to go in the next day, and uh, both of these ladies had twins, and they were both breech twins, and so um, you know, coming back in the like next day and seeing all six of them, you know, both the women are sitting there holding twin babies, you know, that was one flight, uh, six lives uh, that were saved, and I mean, we I could tell you story after story, and uh, one of the cool things is we we have a chance to go into this hospital and visit patients. It's one of the things that um, I get to do. Um, our kids get to join us with this and the other staff. We get to do um, visit the patients in the hospital. So a lot of times they they come in and they, you know, haven't seen um, the ocean. They haven't seen 
any kind of civilization, which is just, you know, simple buildings, roads, um, some vehicles are there. So for a lot of these people that are in the remote areas, they are so scared when they just, you know, see something outside of their village. So we are able to, um, you know, help them through that. Um, you also help them provide things like um, a fork, a cup, um, a blanket for the bed at the hospital, because when it's an emergency situation and they don't maybe have those items, then, then we can help um, support them and assist them in those areas as well. And um, one of the things, too, that the hospital won't feed them unless they bring a plate and they won't give them a drink unless they bring a cup. So it is critical for them to just have the basic needs met as well as the life flights. And then while we're at the hospital, then, you know, we pray with them and we just try to meet their emotional needs or whatever it is that they they need. That sounds like it could be a very scary experience if you're going into it on your own, not really knowing, you know. Yes, and we they always have to bring a caregiver with them. So that person that comes with them um, a lot of times is experiencing the same feelings, um, but they can go to the market and get them some some basics, um, whether it's banana or, or smoked fish and things like that. But it is also hard for them. So we're there to support them as well. And um, one quick story that I'll share is, um, you know, we get to experience this this um, life as a family and our kids grew up um, being able to do some of these medicine delivery and um, hospital visits with us. And um, one time Mark brought in um, a woman who um, was injured as well as her son. Um, They had some um, domestic disputes in their home and the son was protecting the mom. So he also got injured um, with some machete wounds to his arms and, and back, I believe. And, um, I believe he was about around, they don't really know their ages exactly out there, but I'm guessing he was around 12 years old. And, and so I was able to bring in our, my boys and this little guy did not come in with clothes. So we went through our boys closets and they brought him some flip flops and some shorts and shirts and a sweatshirt. So they were um, able to also think about, you know, this kid is our age and we have things that he may need during this traumatic time. Oh, my goodness. You know, it's so heartbreaking to hear these, but thank goodness that you guys are there to help these people. Well, we, you know, we're like I said, we feel blessed to be able to uh, you use our passions to help other people. And we have an amazing staff. You know, we're, we're back right now. In the states, my our, our daughter's a senior in high school, so we're getting her through high school into college, and I'll be going back and forth. But um, you know, we have an amazing staff over there that continues to to serve the people. We've, I mean, we've delivered one hundred sixty four thousand pounds of medicine now and vaccines. We've uh, we've saved over uh, you know twelve hundred lives through emergency evacuation flights. We've helped stop disease outbreaks. All of these things that uh, we just have an amazing team that has the same passion that we do this idea that those people deserve a chance at life, you know, just because they weren't, uh, just because they weren't born here in the, in the USA and they don't have all the things we have access to that they, they also deserve them, that God values them as well. And um, we all, we all have that passion. And so, um, you know, we can't, we're only as good as a team we have and and, uh, it's great that we get to speak, but I just want to shout out to our team and just say how thankful we are uh, for the amazing group that we have uh, serving and flying the planes. We have, Two seaplanes now. The organization is growing. Uh, third one we just purchased um, that that'll be going over next year as well. And so it's been exciting. It's it was a long time getting that one airplane over there, and now we're uh, we're slowly growing and uh, more staff is coming on board as well. And so uh, it's exciting to see that um, you know we feel like we have been able to to make a significant difference. But on the other hand, we feel like we're just getting started, and we can't wait to to do more. Yeah, I can imagine, you know, from, from building houses in Mexico, what made you decide that Papua New Guinea was the place you wanted to do this ministry work? Yeah. You know, I think the, the calling I had or that moment uh, in life where I just felt like I was supposed to go to a remote area uh, of the world to, 
to uh, share my passion for people in aviation. I, at the time, I didn't know that was Papua New Guinea, but when I went there as a 19 year old in 1994, uh, that's really, and seeing the needs there and living with the people um, in remote communities and, and seeing the water, seeing the lack of access in that area, that really solidified for me that that was, that was where we, I needed to, to serve. And then, uh, you know, meeting my wife a couple of years later, um, you know, this has been an amazing journey for, for us and um, for our whole family. You know, our kids uh, pretty much have grown up over there now and, and have had a chance to serve and to see the needs and we've been able to serve as a family, which to us has been a big, a passion of ours is like, how do we get our kids? You know, how is it not just dad's job or mom's job, but how, how do we serve as a family? And I think that's been a, something unique for our, our family that the, that our three children have been able to, to kind of grow up in, in a service environment, growing up, uh, seeing people that have these huge needs and, and seeing that they can look around and do something about it. And I think in America, that's something that uh, my goal is to challenge people as I get a chance to tell stories and to, to speak. It's, it's, uh, you know, Kira and I have a passion to really inspire people uh, here in the USA to say, Hey, what are you guys doing? There's needs everywhere. You know, you don't have to go to Papua New Guinea to make a difference in the world. There's needs in your neighborhoods. There's needs in your communities and you know, do something, get, get uh, out get and involved. make a difference. Yeah. Make a difference where you're at. Now, it seems that your story will really inspire so many other people to look for those opportunities because you've made such a tremendous impact with what you're doing. Yeah, we hope we hope so. You know, it's uh, and, and people want to get involved with what we're doing in New Guinea. We, we love the partnerships and you can check us out at SamaritanAviation.org. Uh, we're on Facebook as well um, and at, and Instagram at Samaritan Aviation. But, you know, the, the needs are so great around the world. And uh, we're, we're um, you know, I'll tell you one quick story. Right before we arrived, there was a cholera outbreak, which was something we don't deal with in the States. Uh, but, uh, you know, 3,000 people lost their lives on the river there. It's a very quick-moving disease. And uh, that was literally three months before we arrived. And since we've been there the last 10 years, we've never had an outbreak like this. Um, we've had outbreaks start, but we've been able to contain them. And, uh, you know, the, to, to where only a couple people would, would lose their life instead of thousands. And I think uh, just showing the, the need over there and, and the reason uh, that we're there, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's, you know, we, we can't do it without, without our partners here in the States either. Uh, one thing that's been really amazing is the government supports us at 40% of all of our operation costs, the Papua New Guinean government. And so it's allowed us. Um, you know, to not charge for any of the flights. So we offer all of these services at no cost. Our pilots and families uh, that are from the U.S. raise their own support so we don't have staff costs from this side. And so um, that has allowed us to do this, to offer this service to to serve these communities at no charge. And that's an amazing thing to be able to offer help to people without expectation in return. And I think that that's really uh, an amazing part of what we do. And um, you know, you can't put that into words when you, when you save a life or when you, you bring someone in and you get to sit with them, you know, a couple of days later after they've gone through this traumatic time and, or a new baby's born and you get to see the, the baby hold the baby and just, uh, sit with people and, and, and know that your life is counted, you know, that you, you've, you've done something, you've made a difference in those communities, but, uh, you yeah, know, that's amazing. So we're, we're, what I say, I guess is we're some ways we're the lucky ones, you know, I know it's, it's been hard sacrifice and all those things, but to be able to actually do that. But on the flip side of that is without all the supporters back in the USA, you know, uh, faithfully believing in what we were doing and giving funding. I mean, that's amazing to me that, um, you know, those people are just important as important. Uh, we can't do it. Uh, it's a partnership and uh, you, you can't do one without the other. And so, you know, to those people who, who don't have the ability to get involved, you know, give of your resources, you, you know, you have time, uh, resources and talent and uh, do something, you know, with your life and make a difference. My goodness. Yes, without a doubt. I mean, my goodness, you guys are doing such great work. And on average, what, how many flights are you saying that you're probably taking a day? Because it, I guess it, you're pretty busy. Yeah, it, it varies. You know, one thing about emergencies is you, you can't plan emergencies. And so, 
there, I've had I've had up to five flights in a day when I was there by myself, and then uh, uh, other times, you know, we'll, we'll fly one to two times a day. We usually bring in uh, around twenty patients a month, critically ill patients, and then we have medicine deliveries, the vaccine outreaches. Uh, I mentioned that earlier this year, uh, polio came back for the first time in 18 years in the country. And so we worked very closely with World Health Organization and UNICEF to to vaccinate all of these remote communities and uh, being able to use the airplanes to fly in and bring in ice and vaccines and, and teams into these places uh, allowed us to, to, to get to help stop this out, this polio outbreak, which is Something that's very, uh, uh, very scary, uh, especially in these remote communities. Um, and so, the, yeah, the planes, planes are amazing. You know, the, the build, it's just access, really, to be able to go into these remote communities, land anywhere. We have a we have a shirt that says, uh, ask us about our 700 mile runway because uh, we can land anywhere on this river and offer these life saving uh, services. Oh, my goodness. I mean, you both are such heroes. And I. I just applaud you because the work you're doing is so heartfelt. You can tell that you're just living a life of service. This, and you talked about your children earlier. This really must be impacting their lives as well. And I can imagine in such a positive way. Yeah, I think so. You know, when I, when we talk to the, to the kids and when they, you know, speak about their times there, this idea that, uh, you know, people are more important than things. That's kind of a theme with our kids that they, they always bring up. Um, that, that they just understand now, you know, um, it, things are nice and it's nice to have, to come back to the USA and have uh, access to fast food restaurants and the, uh, uh, internet, internet, and, uh, you know, <laughs> the other things, you know, social media, whatever. Uh, but you know, that's really our, our goal for them really, you know, is that they understand that people are more important than things and that, um, that they're able to, to to see the needs around them and, and to help people in need. Um, it's not all about, uh, you know, uh, superficial things that people are more important than, than stuff, I guess. And with such powerful lessons. Well, how can people get connected with you guys and get involved in either donating? Cause I'm sure if someone has a plane they want to give you, you'll, if it fits your needs, you'll take it. Right. Absolutely. They can go to um, SamaritanAviation.org and we have information on the website of, um, it's a 501c3, so it is tax deductible. And um, and if they want to donate, we do accept airplanes for sure. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, we, you know, we're always looking for monthly uh, donors and partners. You can also follow us at Facebook for weekly stories of lives that are saved. Samaritan Aviation or Instagram as well. Um, but yeah, no, we, we, yeah, we can't do it without all of our partners. And we're basically in the States. We're funded by uh, individuals, churches, foundations, and businesses that, that come alongside of us and uh, believe, believe in, uh, in the serving and saving lives uh, in other parts of the world. So uh, we'd love for people to, to check out our website to, uh, to partner and, and join with us as we, as we work, to save lives in Papua New Guinea. Well, Mark and Kirsten, thank you both so much for being with us here today and talk about Samaritan Aviation. I mean, my goodness, what amazing work you're doing. Well, thanks, thank Miriam, for having us. And uh, Marianne, and uh, yeah, all the best. Well, thank you, Mark and Kirsten. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about not only the great work you're doing, but also Samaritan Aviation and how people can get involved. I know there's ways for donating at SamaritanAviation.org. And also you have all these great opportunities for people who either volunteer or actually work with Samaritan Aviation on the website as well. Well, on that note, we're going to pause here for a quick break. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. We'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. 
Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special. When you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place. Here is where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. There are nearly 2 million Americans living with amputation. Many live right here in San Antonio. Becoming an amputee can be scary, frustrating, isolating, but there's no reason to feel alone. The San Antonio Amputee Foundation is here to help support you and guide you toward resources such as home and car modifications and even prosthetic limbs. For more information or to make a donation, visit saamputee.org. We'll help you live a full, active life, one step at a time. San Antonio Amputee Foundation, healing limbs, hearts, and and souls. If not me, then who? This ethos is driving the Travis Manion Foundation to empower veterans and families of fallen heroes to develop character in future generations. In 2007, Marine First Lieutenant Travis Manion was killed in Iraq while saving his wounded teammates. Travis's legacy lives on in the five words he spoke before leaving for his final deployment. If not me, then who? Guided by this mantra, veterans continue their service, developing strong relationships in the community and thrive in their post-military lives. Visit TravisManion.org and ensure the character of our nation's heroes lives on in the next generation. If not me, then who? Welcome back to Moments with Mary Ann. We're here today with our next special guest, Carrie Murray, who's the president of Shelterbox USA. Now, Shelterbox is a global charity and a world authority on providing innovative, rapid, and practical shelters to families in some of the world's hardest to reach places and some of the most devastated disaster zones. So let's welcome to the show, Carrie Murray. Thank you so much, Marianne. Yeah, what an honor it is to have you here and to talk about the work that you're doing at Shelterbox. You know, gosh, I have to ask you, like, how did you even get involved with this company? So I first learned about the work of Shelterbox when I was on a field deployment in 2010. And I was on the front lines of the crisis in Haiti after that large earthquake devastated uh, many parts of the country. Um, I was a corporate volunteer at the time. I had, at that point in time, my whole professional life was working for a very large corporation, and I was sent on a six-month assignment to do capacity building, and I was a month into that assignment when in January that earthquake uh, took the lives of tens of thousands in Haiti, and it displaced a million and a half people in an instant. And I was, at the time, a corporate volunteer, and I was working in Haiti. I was in Port-au-Prince, and Port-au-Prince was rubble, really, after the earthquake. And really, I was one day working in a camp where thousands of people had been displaced to, and I saw shelter box. Really, it was all across the city, and it was one of the greatest needs that people had after the earthquake was just essential shelter. And the basic needs we all have really revolve around food, water, and shelter. And shelter box was was bringing in their boxes, and the shelter box tents were really helping to provide a place to call home for tens of thousands of people who were displaced by that. And um, that's how I first learned about shelter box. And then I had seen them again in Japan after that tsunami in 2011 uh, had displaced so many. Uh, And then again, in the Philippines, after Typhoon Haiyan, I was on a remote island, the Bantayan Islands, and I saw Shelterbox once again. So I actually joined them in 2015, and I kept seeing them in the most remote parts of our world, helping shelter families um, where no other aid organizations were going. And I knew I needed to work for this organization. Well, it sounds like Shelterbox is really doing a lot of great things. 
So why don't we break down what shelter box is? So what does it look like and what does it all entail? Sure. So the basic premise of what shelter box was, was really built on were what it was, it was based on the question, what are the things that you need to sustain your life if you lost everything in an instant? And really um, the focus of the organization is on the provision of emergency shelter in disaster or crisis situations. And so the organization, one, was focused on bringing emergency shelter in. There were a lot of organizations that bring in things like like food, water, very few bringing in emergency shelter to kind of keep you alive in the aftermath of a catastrophe. So the founders created the first shelter box. It's taken many iterations over the years, but the center of gravity is a family emergency tent. It looks like a recreation tent, Marianne. It is not. It is made for humanitarian purposes. It is a durable, waterproof tent that can withstand very high wind, rain, and it is the place that a family will call home. In addition to the shelter itself, the other things that are included inside of the green shelter box include things like a water purification unit. In disasters, you often have contamination of the water source. Purified water is so critically important. So a thirst aid station, containers to store purified water. Solar lights, you often in these situations have uh, loss of power. So really basic waterproof lights that, again, uh, enable you to have some light for basic tasks, for safety. The other things we include are mosquito nets, waterproof ground mats, blankets, cooking set. So eight organizations bringing in food, you need something to prepare a meal in. So stainless steel cooking equipment and basic materials to be able to, to eat a meal with a family. A toolkit. So In disasters, you see people literally digging out with their bare hands, so really basic tools to help with that repair process. So a handsaw, a hammer, twine, ropes, gloves. Um, And then other essential items you often in disasters have um, damage to infrastructure beyond homes. So schools obviously have been impacted. So we include a children's activity pack as well. Now, one box will serve one family. It, all these materials come inside one durable green plastic box. That box is often used as well to, stir, to store household items. It's, we've seen it to, used to store purified water. It's used as a bassinet. So all of these materials come together and take the shape of a shelter box. And it really allows families to survive and just the basic household items to start to rebuild their lives after being displaced from their homes following a disaster or another humanitarian crisis. It's interesting. Most people don't even consider that, you know, people need a place to stay, a place that they can actually call their home some type of shelter when these disasters hit. It, absolutely. Um, and so a shelter box, you know, I think when you see that green iconic box with the tent and then the basic household items, that is one item that we provide and it really is iconic and it goes with our name. But we have a variety of different shelter solutions that shelter box provides. Um, in addition to the box, we have another item called a shelter kit. And in these situations that we're going into, you've often had damage to homes. So you might lose a roof or the walls and say a hurricane situation. So we have basic repair kits that help you temporarily, temporarily repair a home that's been damaged so that family can shelter in place. Uh, We have a variety of different tents that we deploy, depending on the environmental situation that we're going into. So, you know, it is, is it wet weather? Is it a cold weather climate? Uh, Is it a conflict situation? So we have a whole variety of different types of tents and, and shelter solutions based on the situation that we're deploying and responding to. And I can tell you, it's always different. Well, it's interesting that you can fit so much in one of these boxes. 
because I, I look at this and it's like, gosh, you know, you, you've got, you've got tents, you've got supplies, you've got all sorts of things that people can use. How do you decide what goes in each shelter box? Is it different for each operation? Uh, it is. And so there is a standard stock shelter box that has our standard relief tent and water purifier and solar lights. But we often will adapt the types of boxes that we deploy depending on the situation and the assessments that are done. So one of the important pieces uh, to know about shelter box is we are about the hand delivery of aid to the beneficiary level. We get to the community level and to the, the actual beneficiary that will be sheltering and utilizing the aid. And one of the ways we do the work is through the deployment of what's called the SRT, the Shelter Box Response Team. These are civilian volunteers that are some of the most highly trained people in emergency response. And they go through extensive training to become a response team member. One in 30 people will make it through the program. But one of the important things that they do when they deploy with the operations team is they conduct assessments. So in disaster situations, Shelter Box works with the UN shelter cluster around the coordination of humanitarian aid and to determine who's most vulnerable and what's needed. We feed into the shelter cluster and part of those assessments is really working with the local community and our local humanitarian partners as well as the UN within the cluster system to determine what the needs are. And that will really determine what aid, humanitarian aid that shelter box deploys for that situation. And so what we try to do is we, we, we try to deploy what's obviously um, it within the region. And so we look across our inventory. We are a model of prepositioning. We preposition humanitarian aid across the world. And what we, what we try to do is really preposition aid that's endemic to within that region and draw down from that inventory. Um, ideally, we have it, you know, aid within that country, and oftentimes we do. Um, but we, we really look to conduct these assessments and determine what aid do we have that is most relevant and most needed. And those, as you asked about the, the boxes, we often customize our non-food item aid shipments in smaller green boxes and these midi boxes will often have things, they're smaller parcels that have things like nets, mosquito nets, blankets, ground mats, water purifiers, solar lights. And we customize those depending on what the needs are, the number of families that we'll be working with. Um, oftentimes we will also procure items in country. So with our shelter kit solution, we'll, we'll often be um, including and, and procuring things like corrugated iron. We could be working with local, you know, uh, framing and timber. We could be getting mud brick that is sourced locally. So it just, it really depends. And as I mentioned, every situation uh, is different and, and requires a very custom approach to the response. Well, it sounds like you guys know what you're doing. And did I understand correctly that you were your company, Shelter Box, was also nominated for a um, a prize as well? Yes. So uh, there are millions and millions of humanitarian organizations across the world, and um, each year, I would say about a hundred get nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. And in 2018, Shelterbox was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. And again, in 2019, we have been nominated for that prize. And it's really um, a testament to the work that Shelterbox is doing in conflict situations. And I always say, Marianne, if it, if it bleeds, it leads. And it's on the worst day ever in a horrible disaster situation, earthquakes, tsunamis, that people tend to care about the work of shelter box. And it's really because it follows the headlines. And so when the news headlines are talking about a specific issue, that's when I would say the humanitarian um, 
you know, organizations like ours really receive the bulk of the charitable contributions. But but there's this other whole piece of the work at Shelterbox that never makes the headlines. It never makes uh, the news and really garners that public attention. And that's the work that we do quietly in conflict situations. And that includes our work in Syria. And that was really the basis for the, the nomination of Shelterbox um, in 2019 is the longest running piece of shelter boxes work has been the continuous work in Syria. And it's obviously displaced millions of people. Um, Right now it's just awful when you see um, the recent airstrikes in places like Idlib. um, And there are just hundreds of thousands of people who have been displaced right now in that part of Northwest Syria um, and are struggling to simply survive. And so for it, it, places like Syria, it's very custom solutions. Um, it's different than the standard shelter box that I mentioned. Um, we're deploying in Syria everything from plastic sheeting for those buildings that are bombed out, um, bombed out doors and windows. You need a protective layer to mattresses, children's clothing, sometimes food parcels, kerosene heaters, really basic items, tents, tarps, things that really are helping people who are just struggling to simply survive what will likely be the the worst humanitarian crisis of our generation. And so that Nobel Peace Peace Prize nomination is really a testament to that quiet work, but truly life-saving work that Shelterbox is doing uh, in in places um, where people have driven uh, been driven by the conflict and forced to flee their homes. So how do you get the shelter boxes to these really remote locations? So the logistics are without a doubt the most complicated part of the disaster response. And we transport shelter boxes, shelter kits, other humanitarian aid into disaster zones really in the most efficient and effective ways that we can. And that is always different. And it's often by road. It could be sea. It could be by air. It, you know, you could, you see shelter boxes and donkeys. You see them on the heads of beneficiaries. And, you know, I think one of the things that we do to help expedite the delivery of aid is pre-positioning in locations around the world so that we can instantly respond as needed. And then once in country, our shelter box response team members work with local authorities, other relief agencies, other partners in the field to really deliver that aid to those who need it most. And I think one thing that defines the expertise of our response team members is that they often get sent to the most remote parts and the most difficult to reach places. Uh, They really go the last mile to reach people who would often be forgotten. And I think the the logistics piece is always the most challenging. Um, But I think, you know, our our worldwide network of partners, response team members, and how we pre-position aid is a real key component to our ability to respond when disaster strike. So how can people get involved or, you know, be part of Shelterbox? How does that work? So... Shelter Box is fueled by private charitable support and volunteer power, human capital. And we really rely on one volunteerism, and it's at so many levels from our ambassadors here in the United States that really help raise visibility and really help talk about and get people interested in the work of the organization. They help raise charitable donations. We also have the program I mentioned, the Shelter Box Response Team Program, which is a different level of volunteerism. It's actually deploying to the front lines of crisis situations. It requires a tremendous amount of training and continuous training. And to stay active as a response team member, you have to deploy a minimum of once a year. And those are typically two week deployments. And then you train like reservists and you you have monthly webinars and operations briefings where you continually train on the work of Shelterbox. And then the other ways that people get involved, um, 
everything from schools doing fundraising and churches to individuals, foundations, companies getting involved. And as a privately funded charitable organization, we do rely on the generosity of just the general public that supports and enables this work. We couldn't do it without it. And so people get involved in many ways. They donate their birthdays, Mary, and on Facebook, and they make monthly contributions and they help support the overall work that we do. And the, the, the easiest way to do that to direct um, your listeners is to go online to shelterboxusa.org and you can learn about volunteer opportunities and all the opportunities that we have as well as how to make a charitable donation to Shelterbox USA. So, gosh, we've covered so much. What are some of the places that Shelterbox is currently assisting in now? So many places, Marianne. So I mentioned, obviously, the work in Syria. Um, That is something that is continuous. We have several projects ongoing. We're gearing up for our winterized sets in Syria. We're also working in Somaliland right now. And that is an area that has been overcome by drought. And we're working in camp situations, providing hundreds of households with essential tents and household items. We're responding right now with Paraguay. We're working with our local Rotarian partners in Paraguay, as well as with Habitat for Humanity. And we are working really closely with communities um, across those devastated areas that have been overcome by flooding. And so we are in the in the process this week of doing active distributions to displaced families there. Uh, We're working in the Lake Chad Basin of Africa. When you look at the Human Development Index, some of the most vulnerable and some of the poorest people on our planet are in the Lake Chad Basin of Africa. And this is places like Cameroon, Niger, Chad, and you've had huge displacement of people within that region because of Boko Haram violence. You probably heard of the the Chubak girls, um, school girls, and that continues, that that displacement in that region is in the many, many millions. And so we have a variety of projects that are going on within the region from one of the largest refugee camps, which is called Minnewau Camp in Cameroon, Um, to smaller, more informal settlements across that region and really just working to help people who um, are struggling to simply survive in the Lake Chad Basin of Africa. Um, The Philippines, um, endemic to big disasters, as you know, uh, Hurricane Alley and Typhoon Alley and in the Philippines, we have an uh, in-country warehouse local staff or registered as a nonprofit in the Philippines. It is also... Um, an island nation that we continually respond to each and every year uh, because it is just endemic to really catastrophic disasters that displace very vulnerable people. So I hope that gives you a sense of where we are. Um, It's really across our world and um, our deployment map really changes continuously. Um, There are some things that have been, that have stayed a constant places like Syria Uh, But we respond wherever we need to. And it's really, you know, our vision and our mission is to ensure no family without shelter after disaster strikes. And so that can take us anywhere, including here in the United States. I understand that you guys also partner with um, other companies like Luminade. And um, who are some of the other ones that you collaborate with? Yes. Yeah, so, um, I mean, it really takes a village to do humanitarian work. Um, you're never working alone. I would say one of our um, critical partners that really enable the, the global work of, of Shelterbox is, is Rotary. And Rotary International is, a, you know, a, one of the oldest service organizations in the world. Um, it's been part of what we do since we were founded. And we are Rotary International's only project partner in disaster relief. And it's Rotarians that are often the first point of contact for shelter box response team members when they arrive in country. And they really help enable our work. They serve as volunteers. They help with fundraising. They're a big tie that binds. Uh, We also work with other aid organizations 
Uh, we work with, as I mentioned, the UN, the UNHCR, UNICEF. We worked with the International Federation of the Red Cross. Uh, you know, we've worked with IOM, the International Organization for Migration. And we have a global MOU with Habitat for Humanity. So oftentimes it's, it's shelter box that's literally bringing in the physical shelters and the goods. We often scale the response with the support of volunteers from many of these organizations. Um, and you mentioned our eight items. We do partner with many organizations. One of them is Luminade. Um, solar lights is so important to helping people feel safe and to do basic tasks. So we work closely with them on the provision of solar lanterns. Um, our tents are designed by a Scottish company called Vengo. Um, and um, we really work closely with the manufacturers of, of each of the products that we source. And um, there are some that we work continuously with like Vengo and Luminate. Uh, but it really does take a, a very large coordinated effort to get this work done and it's always supported with the um with the, the support of partners and that really fuels and makes the work possible well carrie gosh i mean we can talk for hours on what you're doing at shelter box you guys are doing such great work and thank you for all the humanitarian work that you're doing again where can our listeners connect with you and either donate or learn how to be a volunteer Great. Um, your listeners can go to shelterboxusa.org for information on how to volunteer, how to make a donation, or get involved. Okay. Well, Carrie, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you, Marianne. I so appreciate it. Well, thank you. If you'd like to learn more about Shelterbox and how you can be involved, please reach out to them at shelterboxusa.org for more information. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Marianne airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.